Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still do not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, good morning. Good morning, church. How great is it to be together uh, on Easter Sunday to celebrate our risen King? Uh, My name is Matt. If we haven't met, uh, I am the site pastor of our Chipping Norton site, and it's such a privilege uh, to be here to talk about Jesus this morning. Um, So I'm going to dive right in. I wanted to cut to the chase 
And I wanted to start by asking you, uh, how much hope do you have at the moment in life? How's your hope going? There's a lot to despair about at the moment, isn't there? Uh, the world is a distressing place, uh, and the evidence is pretty constant. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that things are getting worse than they were before, uh, but certainly uh, we're bombarded by bad news uh, more than we ever have been in history. Uh, between war and the threat of war, between inflation, pandemic, earthquakes, polarisation, I don't know, however many other crises we're facing at the moment, uh, you could be very forgiven uh, for not being full of hope at the moment. This is a stressful time to be alive. Hope is a very important thing in life. Research shows that hope is linked to resilience. Uh, it's linked to positive mental health outcomes. Uh, and I think many of us know that the, uh, the worst moments of life are when we've run out of hope. Hope is very important. Now, hope simply means the anticipation of good. The anticipation or the expectation that good is coming in the future. In our day-to-day -day life, though, we can water down this definition of hope until it means a little more than a wish, something we uh, would like to have happen but don't actually expect will happen. We can say things like, I hope I win the lottery. Uh, or you might be thinking, I hope we're out of here by 11. <laughs> I, I even heard Ben say, I hope the Dragons win the Premiership this year. <laughs> this isn't hope, because no one actually expects these things will happen. <laughs> hope is firmer than that, though. Hope is the unshakable belief that despite how things look, good will prevail. Like I said, now might not be the easiest time to find that coming naturally. The Easter story drops us right into the lives of women and men that were also living in a context where I don't think hope was coming all that naturally. They were no strangers to the kinds of uncertainties that we face. For a Jew living in the first century AD, things were pretty bleak. Israel had been invaded again and again, uh, most recently in 63 AD by Rome, uh, who were still occupying the land. This meant the constant threat of war. This meant great financial strain. Uh, Rome was taxing them, and the Jewish tax collectors were overtaxing them and keeping the rest for themselves. But this was God's people. These were the people that were meant to be blessed, to be a blessing. These were the people that were meant to be a light to the nations around them. These were the people that were meant to live in peace and prosperity and freedom. And they had none of that. None of it. And they were tiny in the face of Rome. I think it would have been as easy then as it is today to live in despair. Now, if, if you were a Jew living in about 20 AD... I think you would have said you had hope. I think you would have said you had hope. I just am not sure you would have felt like you were bursting with it, that it was bubbling up to the surface. See, the, the Jewish people, they knew that things weren't right in the world. They knew that it needed rescuing. And I think if we're honest, whether or not uh, we're a Christian here today, we know that too. We know that the world around us uh, is perhaps not the way it ought to be. But the Jewish people, they knew that their God, that our God, had promised to make it right one day. Their God had promised that one day he would raise up a mighty king, a Messiah, who would, who would come, who would restore the world to the way it was meant to be. That was the hope that they would have said they had. By Jesus' day, they believed lots of things about this king, based on what the Old Testament had said. They believed that this Messiah would defeat all evil, including death, and that all the faithful people would be resurrected, would be brought back to life by God, and that they would live forever in a renewed earth, experiencing everlasting peace and prosperity. This was what they would have said was their hope. This was what the Old Testament promised. So I am sure that they had hope up here in their heads, 
Uh, but I'm less sure they were walking around uh, with hope here, overflowing in their hearts. But then the most extraordinary thing happened. A rumour started to spread. I can imagine the, the murmuring, I can imagine the muted optimism, I can imagine the thrill of hope. We think the Messiah has come. We think it's Jesus of Nazareth. This is the story we're dropping into the middle of today. This despairing world experiencing the possibility of hope. And, and this is why 2,000 years later, Easter is still so powerful. Because God enters this world that is perpetually on the brink of despair and he infuses it with hope. And that is always good news. Oh. At Easter, we learn that the only true source of hope is Jesus. And I believe that the Holy Spirit can use this story to fill you with hope as you trust in Jesus. Uh, so I just wanted to pause and pray before we jump into the passage. Uh, Jesus, we need hope. I know there are people in this room that really need hope. Maybe people watching online that really need hope. And we believe that you are the only true source of hope and your spirit is the only one that can work hope in us. So I pray that you use this message today, that you... Help us to remember what you achieved 2,000 years ago and that it would be the basis of our hope and that we would be people who are, who are overflowing with this, this hope that the world so needs and that we would take hope out into the world as we leave here. Amen. Well, so the passage we read today comes from John chapter 20. Uh, we read the whole chapter um, because it's, a, it's the Easter Sunday story. But we're going to focus on, on the little account towards the end uh, when I jump in. The book of John is one of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Uh, it's a biography of Jesus, uh, which John wrote uh, to help his readers understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. It's an incredible book, and if you're part of George River, we've been reading through it all year so far. Uh, John is a meticulous author. If you've read it, you'll, you'll know what I mean. He is so careful in the way he structures this book and this whole biography points to John 20, this moment that we're looking at today. This is the climax of the story that John has been telling. Everything leans into this point. Uh, there's so much uh, careful planning and structuring in how he writes this book um, to ensure that it points to where we are today. John records seven signs that Jesus does, seven miracles that are meant to flesh out our picture of what Jesus is like. John records seven I am statements, seven times that Jesus gives clues himself about who he is and what he's like. You might have seen some of these. This is a carefully structured book. John wants everything he writes to help us come and see who Jesus is. And then Jesus dies. And it, it all looks over. Can you imagine what that's like? for someone who's followed Jesus around day in, day out for three years? For someone who has seen with their own eyes those seven miracles? For someone who's heard with their own ears those seven I am statements? Have you ever had the realisation that someone you look up to is not who you thought they were? It's crushing. Just crushing. And I am sure that Jesus' followers were crushed on Good Friday. Did we get our hopes up for nothing? Now, one of these followers is a man named Thomas. You heard him mentioned in the video. We see Thomas appear a few times throughout this account of Jesus' life. Uh, and I really like Thomas. I think he's a lot like you and me. Uh, he has moments of, of virtue where he looks good, like we do. Uh, there's one time where he's, he's all brave and he encourages the rest of the disciples to go with Jesus to Jerusalem, even though it might cost them their life. Uh, he has moments of confusion as well, like we do. Uh, there's another time where he just flat out has no idea what Jesus is talking about. Uh, and I reckon no one else in the room knew either, but he was the one brave enough to speak up and ask Jesus what he meant. Uh, and those two things, that's, that's pretty much all we know about Thomas. So when Thomas has followed Jesus for three years, and now everything Jesus has said and done comes to an anti-climax with his death, 
I am sure that Thomas too was crushed. Everything is moving in one direction and then slap, it all comes to a screeching halt. Now, we know that the death of Jesus is not an anticlimax, but a climax. Because we know what happens next. But how could his followers have possibly known that? No one in Jesus' day believed that the Messiah, that God's promised king, would be executed by the government of a foreign occupying power. So again, I suspect that all of the disciples, including Thomas, were crushed. How could any of this have been true about Jesus? If he was who he said he was, if he was here to do what he said he was here to do, then he wouldn't be dead. Now, um, ultimately, we can only speculate what the disciples felt. We don't have their diaries. Uh, But we get glimpses that they have given up hope when Jesus is killed. Uh, The women uh, mentioned in that story that we saw in the video, the women who were going to the tomb, they weren't going to the tomb expecting to find it empty. They were going with all the things they needed to tend to his grave. We also know from other stories uh, that other disciples have left Jerusalem already, and they're on their way back to the the towns and villages that they came from. So we get these glimpses um, that that they have given up hope. Uh, And we we don't actually know where Thomas is at this point, and we don't know what he's doing. Because the disciples are together in a room, uh, and the risen Jesus shows up, and Thomas isn't there. It seems like maybe it's the end for this sometimes brave, sometimes curious disciple. But there is another story about Thomas, and it's the story we heard this morning, and I I personally, honestly think it's one of my favourite and perhaps one of the most powerful stories in the New Testament. I don't know why Thomas wasn't with the rest of the group when Jesus first appeared to them, and we we do not know enough about Thomas to make a good guess. Uh, It's possible that he had given up hope and gone home. That's very possible. Uh, it's possible that he was hiding and, and so afraid that he wasn't even hiding with the rest of the disciples. He was hiding by himself. Uh, or it's possible that he, w- he was the brave one. Maybe he was the one that wasn't in hiding. After all, one of the only facts we know about him is that he can at least like, look brave. But we, we don't know. What we know for sure is that if he did leave, he came back. If he did go into hiding, he came out again. Because he reconnects with the other disciples at the start of our story today. So let's just dip back in to verse 24. Uh, John writes this. Now Thomas, uh, also known as Didymus, curious little fact, both Thomas and Didymus mean twin. So he was probably a twin. Uh, One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Now I want to pause. Uh, I want to stick up for Thomas for a moment. I'm a little bit sympathetic to him because unfortunately the next words out of his mouth have literally defined him for 2,000 years. (laughs) This is what happens. Uh, But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Because of this line, poor Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas for 2,000 years. But I am so glad that these words have been left here for us to read. Uh, One of the main reasons that people uh, dismiss or don't believe in the resurrection, uh, maybe if you're here today and you're sceptical yourself about the resurrection, maybe this is one of your reasons. But one of the main reasons is the belief that people used to be really superstitious and gullible. That they would believe anything that they're told, and that's why they fell for the lie that Jesus came back to life. Have you ever heard or thought something like that? Our attitude can be, you know, these are, these are simpler people from a simpler time, but we know that this is impossible. I think Thomas's doubt here helps to challenge our scepticism about that. Thomas shows us two crucially important things. Firstly, he shows us that these weren't simple, uneducated, gullible pre-moderns 
who would believe any half-baked story. Thomas, like us, knows that dead people stay dead. And, and he's not going to believe otherwise unless he sees some evidence. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that there were thoughtful, intelligent people who scrutinised the other disciples' claims and sought evidence for the resurrection. That we don't have to just believe they took it on faith value. Maybe, maybe Doubting Thomas is fair. Maybe that's a fair name. But I am really glad that he doubted and that we know that he doubted, that that was not glossed over. Uh, secondly, Thomas shows us, and maybe more importantly, he shows us that we can come to Jesus with our doubts. And this is very important. We can ask Jesus to help us believe. Later in our passage, or the next verse, Jesus does come to Thomas. And this is what it says. A week later, the disciples are in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Jesus, to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. I think Thomas here is a great example of bringing our doubts to Jesus rather than letting us drive a wedge between us and God. And really powerfully, do you notice Jesus doesn't berate Thomas? He doesn't talk down to Thomas. He lets him see the evidence. He, he shows him the scars and the wounds. He satisfies his curiosity. He works with his doubts. So, so I think Thomas's doubt is a gift to us. It shows, on the one hand, that these weren't simple, gullible people. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it shows us that it's okay that we have doubts sometimes too and we can bring them to Jesus. They don't need to drive us away from Jesus. The real highlight of the story, though, is what comes next. The key question for Thomas in these days between Friday and Sunday was, did I get my hopes up for nothing? That's the key question. Did I put my hope in Jesus for nothing? Was that all a waste? This hope that he had, this confidence that he had previously felt about who Jesus is, that is what was suddenly undermined when Jesus died. And now, Thomas, crushed by Jesus' death, doubting whether Jesus was who he said he was, has realised that Jesus is alive again. He has seen the scars. He has witnessed the wounds. And in honestly one of the most spectacular moments in the New Testament, he has a profound understanding of who Jesus is and he says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. This is the third gift that Thomas gives to us. My Lord and my God. This moment of clarity when Thomas joins all the dots in his mind, where all that was uncertain suddenly becomes clear, when all his doubt is erased, when he truly realises who Jesus is, and when, for the first time in the whole New Testament, someone explicitly calls Jesus God. Thomas, who seemed to have given up, is now the very first person to realise the fullness of Jesus' identity and his divinity. If you've been tracking with us, this is the absolute climax of our Come and See series. This is, this is the point John has been pointing to all along. All of John's biography is painting this remarkable tapestry of who Jesus is and what he's like. The different things he does, the miracles that reveal different facets of who he is, the different things he says, the statements that give clues about who he is, all of it, all of that is wrapped up in this one single statement my Lord and my God. In this moment, all of Thomas' hope was restored. And this very moment, for all of us, this is the basis of our hope too. Our hope can't be anchored in an ideology. Our hope can't be uh, anchored in something like the possibilities of technology. Our hope can't be anchored in the idea of progress. Our hope certainly can't be anchored 
in circumstances because they change, they fluctuate, they come and go. Our hope must be anchored in a person. Our hope is in Jesus. This is what we remember on Easter Sunday. This historical event, this raising from the grave 2,000 years ago, this is the basis of all our hope. Let me just point out three ways I think that is. Firstly, the, the resurrection is the hope of the future fate, the future destiny of people who follow Jesus. We don't believe, uh, while Jesus' resurrection was unique, we don't believe it's a one-off event in history. But that there is a day coming when all of Jesus' followers will also be resurrected to live forever in Jesus' kingdom. This is our hope. The Apostle Paul calls Jesus the first fruits of resurrection. I'm not a farmer. I had to do some first fruits research. Um, some of you may know this more than I do. But the first fruits are the first fruits to pop up. They're the, the first signs of a coming crop. And they guarantee that the rest of the crop is coming. I think that's helpful. This is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn. First, Christ the firstfruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. So Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of the season. Guaranteeing that the rest of the crop, which is you and I, which is everyone who follows Jesus that we also will be resurrected. So this moment, this resurrection, this is the basis of our hope, that we know Jesus rose again, and we know that those who follow him, the same will happen. Uh, secondly, uh, more broadly, the resurrection is the hope for all creation, for all creation. Jesus is coming back, and when he does, uh, what he did for his people he will do for all the earth. Jesus is going to renew this earth. This is such good news. The creation itself will experience resurrection. Again, Paul spells this out best, this time in Romans 8. And this is what he says there. He says, For the creation waits in eager expectation, eager expectation, hope, for the children of God to be revealed, which is what will happen when all of Jesus' followers are resurrected. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. This is not just our hope, this is the hope for the whole world. Jesus' resurrection fills us with hope that there is a day coming when this tired and broken world, full of evil, full of death, full of decay, will one day be set right again. And we will live forever in this new world, experiencing a perfect righteousness and peace and joy. And that's the hope of Easter. And thirdly, looking uh, not into the future anymore, but looking today, Jesus' resurrection is the hope of our salvation. All of us need to be saved by God. The problem of sin, uh, which is not so much uh, the right or wrong we do, um, sin is an orientation of our life towards ourselves and away from God. That's what sin is. It's, it's the, the turning inward of our life um, so that we're our own Lord and God and we turn away from him. That problem of sin, that's what it means to be sinful. It means to have this fundamental orientation towards the self and away from God. A little bit of trivia. Apparently, according to Google, um, the most played song at funerals, uh, does anyone know it, is Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. It's a great song, but that is the essence of sin. To be able to get to the end of your life and take pride in looking back at the entire life and say, I did it my way, 
That's sin. That is what it means to be sinful. Because if Jesus is who he said he is, if he is the Lord of all, then rejecting his way and doing it our way, that, that surely is a path to death. That's not a path to life. We need to be saved from, from that path. And many in this room have been. Perhaps most in this room have been. We need to be saved by reorienting our life. Repenting is turning our whole life away from ourselves and pointing it to Jesus, to the Lordship of Jesus. To be like Thomas and declare, my Lord and my God, to Jesus. A little bit later in the book of Romans, two chapters after the the last part we read, uh, Paul reaffirms this, showing us that this indeed is how to be saved. He says, "If, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are familiar words, I'm sure, for many of us. But do you notice the echoes of the Thomas story here? Thomas came to believe in his heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and he declared with his mouth, Jesus is Lord. See, Thomas, his fourth, his final gift to us is modelling the way to be saved. Thomas models the path to salvation. If if you're sitting here this morning, uh, and I'm sure there's some of you, uh, and you have never considered yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus... This is the invitation to you. Easter provides us, but it provides you personally with a remarkable opportunity to make that decision, to realise that Jesus is the Lord. And not just to say the words, Jesus is Lord, although that is the right starting point, but not just to say those words, but to do what I said before, to reorient your life away from yourself and and towards Jesus. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that a little bit later. But if if you're sitting here, and this would be many of us, and you are a follower of Jesus, this is a wonderful opportunity to consider whether your life reflects your words. Think about whether the life you're living reflects your words. The lifelong journey of being a disciple of Jesus is taking these words, Jesus is Lord, and organising our whole life under the lordship of Jesus. To rearrange everything about us under his lordship. Everything we do, everything we think, everything we say. To, to re-evaluate all of it and to give it all over to Jesus to do it his way. This is what we are all about at GRLC. Disciples wholeheartedly loving, living and revealing Jesus. You hear those words often. It's just another way of saying the same thing taking all that you are and putting it under the lordship of Jesus. And he promises that when we do that, we will truly live. He promises that that is not a burden, but that is the way to life and life to the fullest. I'm going to pray. Jesus, we thank you for the reminder today that you are our mighty king, that you have conquered death and that you live again. We remember today that you are the the only true source of hope. Help us to put our hope in you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I want to pray for um, anyone in the room who is not a follower of you, that you would just be working in their hearts, that you'd be gently stirring them and and reminding them that this is the pathway to to true life. And I pray for all of us in the room who are your followers, Lord, and I pray equally that you're at work in our hearts, calling us to you, reminding us to give it all to you, reminding us that you can carry it all better than we can. And I pray for all of us that we would not just say we have hope, but that we would be full of hope, Today and every day, Lord, I pray that you would send us out after this and that we would be people uh, that 
spill over hope into our community, that people would see the hope coming off us and, and wonder where it comes from, and that we would have opportunities to speak about you. Uh, Lord, we need hope and we need help. Uh, and we just pray that you would do that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, I hope that as you leave today, that as Matt said, you, you will not just have hope up here and know it, but you would be bursting with it, that it would be boiling up inside your heart and spilling out through your Easter lunches and the rest of your Easter weekend. Uh, I do want to share too, just if, if today, if you feel the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart, if you feel... Uh, like you, you just been an emotional roller coaster as you've walked into the building. Uh, we believe the Holy Spirit loves to speak to us, that the resurrected Jesus still speaks to us and he meets us just like Thomas. In the midst of whatever despair or doubts you might have, he wants to know you today.